at the end of the day. Uh, consumers, I'm going to tell you what they want, when they want it, and how much they're going to pay for it. Right. And anybody that thinks differently, uh, I think they're going to end up like Dodo Bird. What are the life lessons that, that you've learned in the, in the past 15 years? If, if somebody's not ready, if the script's not ready, just wait. Can you tell us a little bit about the start of Mad Men? No. Good afternoon, everyone. I, hello. <laughs> I'm Tracy Edmonds, and I'm one of the co-chairs of this year's Produced by Conference, and we want to welcome you guys to today's session. Um, now, <laughs> just to get started, um, thank you so much for joining our session, Lionsgate Rising, a conversation with Michael Burns. Lionsgate has proven itself one of the marquee names in Hollywood today, with a remarkable track record that includes some of the signature films and TV programs of our time. We are privileged to have Vice Chairman Michael Burns with us today to discuss the company's creative and organizational approach to producing top-notch content. But before we begin, I want to give you a brief reminder. Our speaker is going to be happy to take questions at the end of today's session, but please use the index cards that we provided in your registration bags to write down your questions, and ushers will collect them 20 to 25 minutes before the session ends. Well, um, please also include your name as well as your question, and for everyone's sake, if you could try to write really clearly so that we can tell what the question is. And then finally, if you can silence your cell phones and mobile devices for the duration of this session. And um, thanks again for joining us today. And now, please welcome our moderator, the president of Lakeshore Entertainment, the vice president for the motion pictures of, of the Producers Guild, and my fellow Produced by Conference co-chair, Mr. Gary Lucchese. Thank you, thanks, Tracy. Thank you, Tracy. So I just want everybody here to know that um, when, when we were putting together this conference, um, one of the jobs that Tracy and Rachel Klein and I had was to figure out who the speaker should be. And I know Michael and um, know him as somebody who's had the challenge of running Lionsgate for the last 12 years and has succeeded at it and is really a, very much of a futurist. So. It was my idea to approach Michael, and then, then they came to me and they said, well, then you're going to have to ask him the questions, and I said, okay. And I called Michael, and he was nice enough to say yes, but I, I'm very excited about this conference today and very appreciative that you're here, so thank you. So I like trying to know, uh, I, think, I think people's backgrounds influence who they, who they are and who, what, their, what their talent is and who they became. So you're from back east, right? I am. I'm from Connecticut. And so... Um, yeah, sure. You can do whatever you want. So, okay, so you're from Connecticut, and you did you did you were you interested in the movies and t in entertainment as a kid growing up? I think all of us have uh, seen uh, movies. It's funny because over the years since I've been here, I've become pretty good friends with uh, Sherry Lansing and Billy Freakin, who directed uh, The Exorcist, which scared the shit out of me as a uh, right. as a child. And uh, and uh, I, I think I saw it when I was 13, 14 years old. And and uh, I will tell you that we all remember movies that made. Uh, terrific impressions on, our, on ourselves. We, we all have our favorite movies, and, and uh, I love the idea uh, from way back when, the idea of you create an asset and it lasts forever. Right. So, so, so and, and where did you went to, I know you went to the Anderson School at UCLA, but where did you go to college before that? I went to ASU, to ASU. and then I ended up uh, uh, moving west, and uh, I went to the Anderson School, and I'm actually on the board now. Oh, okay. And now, I understand, too, that... Um, you know, okay, I, I know my, a little bit about Michael, that his father is a really interesting character. Now, is it true something where he, sa where he gave you like five grand and said, go, go off, or what, what's yeah, that story? A pretty, it's a pretty, my father, you know, we, we did the show Mad Men. My, uh, my partner, our CEO, John Feldheimer, and I have been friends for 30 years, and, and uh, we were discussing uh, uh, Mad Men, and AMC had pitched it to us, and Kevin Beggs loved the show, and, and, uh, and he said, oh, my God, do we really want to do a movie about Pete? That's my father. Uh, and... Uh, and because he was very much that character, that very much like that Don Draper character. But when I graduated from college, it was one of the great lines of all time because uh, I graduated from college in 1980. He wrote me a check for $5,000, and on the memo of the check, he wrote, The End. <laughs> <laughs> so this was even before you went to Anderson. This was this before. Was before that. That was Whoa. it. He said, I said college. I didn't say anything about business school. <laughs> and, so, and so what did that, so, so you had to come out to Los Angeles and figure out how to make it on your own. Yeah, I, I, I started, uh, I, I was, you know, again, people can, there are a lot of smart people out there in a lot of different industries, and, and timing is so much to do with your success, and really, truly, there by the grace of God. I will tell you that, uh, you know, I went to work on Wall Street in 
the early 1980s. That was a good time to go. Right. So uh, that was uh, uh, sort of my beginning as a business career. Actually, my beginning, I, I, when I first got out of college, before I went to business school, I worked for IBM, right. where I was a sales rep. And I ended up, uh, luckily enough, uh, my, uh, my uh, territory, uh, after graduating from uh, the training program in Dallas, I got to choose where I wanted to go. And they gave me a couple different places that I'd never heard of, and they said Laguna Beach, California. Right, right, right. So I said, that sounded pretty good to me. Yeah. yeah so, so you I end stayed. up at Laguna Beach. So then you go to Anderson, and then you came out, and you started working for Prudential uh, Securities. I, I worked for uh, nine years at Shearson Lehman Brothers, various right. places, various, various jobs. And then uh, what happened was uh, I ended up getting uh, 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 offered a job to run the media practice for Prudential. Right. So what happened was I ended up in, uh, in California, uh, to stay, and so you know everybody says that you shouldn't stay in New York, and you know don't don't stay in New York too long until right. you're too hard, or don't stay in California too long until you you end up soft. Um, but I like both both coasts very much, and I will tell you that uh, I'm happy to be here. Right. So so at so at Shearson, you started uh, f- seeing the financial side of entertainment. Right? I did. I did a deal actually uh, way back when in 1985 for New World Pictures. Right. And another deal with for Fox uh, uh, called Entertainment American Entertainment Partners. We financed movies, right. and uh, it was you know when 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 John and I came to Lionsgate in uh, 19, at really early 2000, I right. guess it would be. Um, we put together a club deal of investors. Uh, I went on the board in August of 99. We put a, put together a club deal in 2000. He was leaving Sony Television, uh, where he ran that for a long time. Right. And I decided I couldn't get on another airplane. You know, I'd already blown up one marriage, and I just, mm-hmm. there was just no way I could right. know, be gone again and do it. So what happened was I um, came back, and uh, uh, we uh, did a club deal. We had, you know, both of us had a lot of uh, relationships mm-hmm. with uh, various people that we thought that would believe that, we, that what we told them, which was we thought there was a great play for consolidation uh, in the content world. So we, Fidelity came in. Harry Sloan, who's a dear friend of John's and a friend of mine, uh, came in. He was running SBS at the time. Herbert Kloiber from Telemuchin came in. And then uh, uh, we also had Gordy Crawford from Cap Research. And then uh, my unemployed friend at the time I visited on Park Avenue, he'd just gotten fired. And I said to him, I said, uh, uh, would you consider this? He goes, well, I'm actually actually got a lot of money. I've just settled out my contract. And that was Jamie Dimon. Wow. Uh, So uh, they all uh, invested. I think it was a $33, $34 million deal. John and I put a little money in. And then uh, uh, we used that effectively to leverage the capital markets all the way along. And we've done that since 2000. So it's uh, it's not exactly an overnight sensation. It's a it's been a you know 13 year 12 right. 13 year track. Right. But what a what a track, right? So you 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 and John get to Lionsgate, and now you're you're sitting there with this with this company that was at at the time uh, um, it was a Canadian company, but that was really at the time when when Canada was really growing quite significantly. So so you started doing a lot of smaller movies and acquiring companies. Was that the corporate strategy? Well, well, again, you're trying to you know it's like Wayne Gretzky said you know you want to be you know want to be where the you know the puck is going. Right. That's where it's been. So uh, Frank Justra started the uh, the company in Canada, Vancouver based. It's named after after a bridge and and the Lionsgate Bridge right. in Vancouver. Right. So our uh, strategy was pretty simple. We said, look, let's tie up all the content we possibly can. Uh, the only two things I really remember, it's embarrassing to say, I hope there's nobody from UCLA out there right. from business school, which is barrier to entry and, and a first mover advantage. Right. So we saw that. We, we said, okay, let's tie up as much content. Uh, let's take all of the uh, players out there. And when, when I say players, I have parentheses around it because right. it was really a bunch of cats and dogs. Right. Um, so we ended up, Lionsgate was a little company. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, but we bought uh, we we made that deal. Then we bought Trimark, and right. then we stalked Artisan for years and years. Right. And then we ended up with Artisan. We bought other libraries along the way. We bought companies. We bought Joe Drake and Nathan Kane's right. man, mandate. Right. Uh, and so the idea was to control as much content as possible. Don't try to be the smart guy to figure right. out what are the new platforms. Right. What are they going to be? Because right. that's a fool's errand. Mm-hmm. And so uh, we ended up controlling. Right now we have over thirteen thousand titles in right. our library. Uh, the library throws off $150 million in cash flow a right. year. One of the things that Jamie, and he was not uh, at times fun to work with, um, uh, but he's a brilliant, brilliant executive, but he said evergreen income, mm-hmm. you know, sort of like plastics in the, in, in the graduate. Right. And he right. said, you want to have the light switch. When you switch it on January 1st, 
you want to have as much of your overhead paid as possible. Right. And so that was very much attendant to the, to the uh, uh, philosophy and the tr strategy that John and, and I had. And you were able to pull that off, too. You had some big, you, you know, the early stuff was Affliction and Gods and Monsters and Dogma and Fahrenheit 9-11. And then, and then you had a hit with Crash, which was a big, you know, you won the Oscar, right? Was, I'll tell you a funny story. I, I don't know, Peter Wilkes, I'll just have a heart attack. But I do remember, um, I'll tell you, actually, this, if I were going to name one movie right. uh, that turned it around for us because uh, you know you sort of you have those magical moments right. those defining moments I will tell you I, we owe that to the goddess of Lionsgate that is Halle Berry right because Monsters Ball was a Monsters very Ball, right. very uh, small budget movie and if somebody had come and pitch it to you guys and said hey it's this goth southern gothic love story right. and it's a interracial and it's just depressing and, right. and <laughs> there's nobody in the room that right. would have bought that movie right and that movie really turned it around for us because she won the best actress and it was an incredibly profitable movie and it took us to a whole new level so uh, but and crash I'll tell you a funny crash story so yeah. I was at the Academy Awards and crash it sort of it was like it was like that that horse that just got scratched from the uh, right. Belmont Stakes right, today, right. sadly but or this weekend but uh, we were the long shot because right. the movie came out in May right opened at nine million dollars mm -hmm. ended up doing 54 but May is too early to, <clears throat> right. at that time to win an Academy right. Award so I'm in the, the theater and we're there. We got a nomination for mm -hmm. Best Picture. But we, uh, they had uh, had the, that was the year of Brokeback Mountain. Right. And so what happened was uh, uh, they had just won um, Best Director. Best Director. Right. So, Ang Lee. And so, right. and so I, I was sitting, I don't know, the 15th, 20th row. Right. So as soon as they won, right. I saw the row in front of me. They were all repositioning themselves to get closer to the aisle. To, to, and I said, oh, the movie gods aren't going to like that one. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and so we uh, ended up winning Best Picture. So, but again, it's the idea of timing, yeah. <laughs> picking the right, right movie at the, uh, at the right time. And, and, and we also had a philosophy that we've stuck with over the years, which is, is know who is going to show up opening weekend. Right. Because this business, you know this, Gary, it yeah. is punishing right, right now right you it's either the haves or have nots right if your movie doesn't uh play and play and play uh and meaning that you've got great scores coming out of the theater and you've got everybody talking about word of mouth like they were on for example i think the biggest multiple in the in business was uh, pretty woman i right. think it only opened at 12 million dollars right. but if that uh, if you don't have that if you don't have an opening weekend number of X, right? You know, your multiple is going to be two and a half, three times. If right. you have something that takes off, Gary and I uh, were fortunate enough to to do a movie together, Lincoln Lawyer, right. which was a movie that Lakeshore did, and people just like the movie. Yeah, they like the movie. And so what happened is the movie opened at uh, thirteen million dollars, and then I did a you know close to a five multiple. Right. That just doesn't happen uh, uh, often anymore. Right. So so let me ask you this because you 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 went through those years, and then. Um, uh, you, uh, you bought Mandate, and with it came Joe Drake. And it, it seems to me that there was a little bit of a difference of philosophy of trying to go a little bit bigger, and then Hunger Games came along. And, you know, that must have... I, I, you certainly knew that you had a franchise um, book at a, cert, at a certain point. And yet, the, you know, that movie was much larger in terms of budget than anything that you had spent before. Were you seeing that the marketplace was changing and that you needed to start taking some of those bigger shots? Well, look, it, the, the, the dream of any studio is to have franchises. Right. So Hunger Games has turned into a terrific Yeah, $400 million dollars this weekend, by yeah, the way. $400 million, yeah, yeah that's going to yeah. uh, be great. Thanks. Um, it's still in theaters, by the way, if you want to go. Uh, <laughs> what I was going to say is it has, uh, it's done $400 million at the box office, but, you know, Joe, to his credit, Joe had, you know, look, it's a tough business. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. he had a couple movies that didn't work, and, you know, we had some movies that uh, uh, did work, and, and Joe very early on and his team, Ali Shermer, who you maybe worked right. at Paramount, yeah. they were very much uh, uh, big fans of the Hunger Games books that sold just a couple hundred thousand copies at right. that time. Now I think there's 35 million right. copies in print. And, uh, but again, the way that Lionsgate works and runs the business is, you know this, we mitigate our risk from right. foreign pre-sales or output deals like the Summit guys have right. now. So um, we just thought that we could take $25 million of risk mm -hmm. at this stage of the company's uh, life cycle. It wasn't going to bankrupt us. Right. And if it worked, it was really going to work. Right. And then we'd do, uh, uh, you know, that would be a, a one of a series of movies. Right. And between that and the Expendables and, you know, Tyler Perry. Right. And the niches that we're particularly good in, obviously, the horror space, uh, we have... Uh, 
we have enough franchises that last week we actually uh, gave directional um, uh, direction to the street saying, look, we think that our cumulative EBITDA over the three years, next three years, will be $900 million. Right. And, and only when you have a franchise, uh, a franchise series, and, and obviously not to mention, not, let's not forget the vampires right. and the werewolves, because right. we bought Twilight. Right. And the risk on that deal, we bought the Summit guys, we bought Patrick and, right. and Rob's company, and the risk on that deal was that Breaking Dawn uh, didn't work. Right. That people had burned out on it. Right. And, we fa- and, and we thought that was not likely. Not likely. And that movie went on to do over $700 million in worldwide box office. I've seen The Last Breaking Dawn. Right. Uh, it's great. Right. Uh, Bill Condon j- just did a terrific movie, and so that comes out in November. So right. if you take a look at that coming out in November, Expendables is coming out this August, we've got another Tyler Perry coming as well, and then you've got uh, Catching Fire coming out next November. Right. And so if you take a look at our slate, we've got a, uh, we've just finished Ender's Game, which, is right. a, which we think is potentially a, a, a franchise as well. Right. So you'll be able to take your sort of swings on, on, on some bigger pictures because you have to. When you get to a certain point, uh, you have to take some more risk right. uh, from a standpoint of, uh, of, of you know, something that, that you can really knock the cover off the ball like Hunger Games. Right. But even if you look at our entire film slate, our uh, risk capital P pre, pre-P&A is less than $15 million. So that's not going to change. Right. This is because they sell, uh, Lionsgate sells off the foreign rights, so they're actually able to um, mitigate your risk. But, but let's, let's, let's think about this now because I... I, I, it, it seems to me, uh, and look, this, the, what Michael has told you, I think, is absolutely phenomenal. But I think one of the questions that um, is, is, is concerning to, to people like me, and I, I'm presuming some of you, is that, is that when you look at this slate now, you've got bigger movies. You've got Hunger Games, and the, the sequels to Hunger Games. You've got the next Twilight. Uh, Ender's Game is a $100 million negative. It's a big, big negative. It's a less than that. Okay, well, it might net less because you get rebates, right, because it's Louisiana or whatever. So let's say, let's say it's 80 but is it, 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 are we walking into a marketplace that is very different from the early days of Lionsgate when you were able to do those smaller movies? Do those smaller movies, are they just, are they stifled by the, the, um, the, the big event, worldwide event film? I, I think it's a have or have not world, but right. I don't think the haves have to be temples. Okay. I mean, take a look at what Jason Blum has right. done with the paranormals of the world. Take a look at what we did recently with the Saw franchise. Right. So I don't think that's changed. Tyler Perry movies aren't expensive. Right, right. So, and then we've got a, we've got a Sam Raimi movie coming out, uh, which is uh, The Possession. Right. Um, so the, my sense is that it's not, about, uh, it's not about size. It's not about budgets. It's about having a hook that you can market. The biggest issue in the business, which is taking a lot longer to, to get better than I think it should have because of Internet and Internet marketing, digital marketing, is the size of P&A budgets. And right. to rise above the clutter of all these movies, all vying, you know, four or five movies, you know, right. you know how difficult, right. the most difficult thing in the business right now, uh, besides making a great movie, which is always difficult, right. is, uh, is finding the right opening weekend. Right. Because if you don't have that, it's over. Right. And so that's the difficult thing. But you, if you have a, a movie, it doesn't matter what the budget of the movie is, if you have a good hook. Mm-hmm. I mean, Saw was easy, you know, kill or be killed. Yeah. Well, the and first movie was genius. For screenplay it was genius, too. but that, that set up the whole thing. Hunger right. Games, Gary Ross did a phenomenal yeah. job on the first Hunger Games. And so he set, it, he set that up. He, he, he cast the movie. Uh, we have good producers, really right. good producers on that. They're all coming back. A lot of the same people are coming back. Right. We have a different director, Francis Lawrence. We're excited about him. He's a real shooter, yeah. as you know. Right. And, and so... Again, if you if you set that if the template is set if you if you've set the foundation, uh, it doesn't matter what the movie costs. Right. And 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 let's look at the, the the landscape though. I mean, like for this this weekend, I'm, I can't imagine that Fox didn't spend fifty sixty to open Prometheus or Madagascar. And last week, I think Universal spent even more than that opening Snow White and Huntsman. You couldn't turn on a basketball game without seeing about six spots. Well, the good news about those pictures, yeah, they all worked. Yeah, that is good news. You know, so that was it because you know I always. See, look out here and see uh, you know everybody all the bloggers and right. some you know it's like Lord Voldemort names that right. you don't want to mention. Um, the uh, but you have these people that talk about you know the death of the business. It's like right. that. It's like that Business Week article, big Business Week headline in 1980, the death of equities. Right. Okay, which is the right. absolute worst time and yeah. they were so dead wrong. Right. So the contrarian contrarian in us says that, or and the me says that we've got uh, again if you get 
my philosophy to the business, and then we've got a lot of new producers and a lot of guys that have been around a long time, is the key for, for all of you, it's controlling material. Right. It's when you went out there and, and, and got Million Dollar Baby. Right. Okay, that was, and then you got Clint, one of the great storytellers mm -hmm. of all time to do it. Um, if you have great material, that a producer is the guy usually out there uh, hawking, if you have that great piece of material, you're going to get a great filmmaker. Right. And the filmmaker is going to get talented actors. Right. And in some cases, movie stars. So I do believe that that's not changed. Right. So I don't think you have to have these giant budget movies. But yeah, we're going to have one or two of those a year. For right. us, big movies. But they're not going to be two or $300 million right. movies. We're right. never going to get killed. And t talk to me, too, about uh, the international market. Now, I know you pre-sell uh, uh, most of the foreign on, on a lot of those movies. At the same time, you have your own distribution in the UK. Now, I know that you're opening Hunger Games in China. So what's the prognosis there? Look, it's funny. I, uh, we saw Men in Black did $50 million. I always, dollars I, always like, I always like looking at Peter Wilkes. He's, yeah. like my, he's my, yeah. my adult supervision. Right. He's the, he's the uh, PR. PR. I can't PR explain guy. how Hunger Games has actually got through censorship in, right. in, in China because it, we, have, we sell it to an all rights buyer and they put it through. And, and it's a pretty, you know, it's a tough subject matter. It's I not negative about the Chinese. So. No, not at all. No, it's not, not at all. like Red Dawn where right. you're going to sort of digitize right, the, right. these they, guys. They were Chinese and became Korean, so, apparently. Did, right. Evidently. Yeah. <laughs> North Koreans. I guess you're going to expand the North Koreans. <laughs> yeah. Koreans. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, but so my sense is that uh, that movie will do well. It's gonna I, be I at, think it will, too. It's going to be in 60, 70 IMAX theaters. It's going to be a wide release. It's a smash. It's, the movie's only done uh, only. I should, God, I can't believe I said that. It's only done $250 million of international. international. So I think the next one's going to do more. And because the books are now <clears throat> catching on around the globe, right. and you've got such awareness because of the fact it's done $400 million here. And what can you keep of the gross in China? What does a, what does a, what does a you know, producer... It, it, I, I don't know. I mean, that's yeah, my... it, here's what I'll say about that. Yeah. Uh, we can, as my father said, uh, we can have uh, y y improve our fair New England return. Right. So okay. <laughs> yes, it, we're not going to. It's not. Gonna, we're not going to make a fortune. Right. Um, but we'll make. Uh, we'll make uh, a few more shekels. And it might open the door to the Twilight series too. No. Or or do they not like? I don't think. I mean, you know what? I I did the Underworld movies. I don't think they like vampires in China. Maybe I'm wrong though. You know, there's something about it. You know, as I as I spent that day, my father. I told yeah. Gary this. My father broke his hip the other night, yeah. which is about as much fun as I could stand. Right. Uh, worse for him, but. Uh, there's something about this vampire and aging thing. Yeah, they got they got that going the right way. Yeah. <laughs> so so okay so so China is a market that is certainly emerging and something that 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 we should all be paying attention. Hey, look, if you, and Russia is a big market too, right? Russia, I mean, you know, I'm going to go. What did you do? What did you do in Hunger Games in Russia? A uh, big number. Uh, it's funny. A former Lionsgate guy distributed there, a sort of guy. Um, uh, Thirty-five, forty, something. I don't know like what. That. I think it was thirty. It was thirty. It, what, tw was it twenty, Peter? Twenty-five. Yeah. Yeah, but it was a big number. And, right. and, but the nice thing about Russia, if you, you, know, you know this, 10 years ago, if somebody had said, you know, Russia is going to be a giant international territory, you would have thought they were smoking weed. Right. And now what's happened is that movie, that, that territory is one of the top five territories for right. us on a lot yes. of pictures. I'm yes. going back. It must be because I'm, I'm flying all the way to St. Petersburg, per your buddy Tom, who asked me right. to speak at some economic forum there, which I, I said I would do. But Russia is a big territory. Big but China, territory. it's a joke because if... Again, five years ago, I right. think we got three hundred thousand dollars of total revenue. Right, with uh, your thirteen thousand titles. And no, no, <laughs> and I think that included India. Right. Okay, so right. that's what is that between the two countries? That's right. three billion people. Right. Yeah. So we, we're pretty sure it's like that old joke about Lou Wasserman, when uh, which is I, I think it's a true story, which is he's in this negotiation and he's right. going around and around on, on on that, and he hasn't said a word for like three days of negotiation. So finally, one of the guys on the other side said, "Lou, Lou, come on." We've been here for three days. You've got to tell us, what do you want? Right. You've got to say something. Right. He said, what, Lou, what do you want? More. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think we're going to get more out of China. Yeah, I think you uh, uh, What do you think about 3D? I think it's great for the right product. Right. Look, I'm not that guy. I, right. think, I, I find sometimes, you know, my, a friend of mine runs, you know, started Real D, Michael right. Lewis. And I, I think some of it's spectacular. For the right movie, we did it with Bloody Valentine and, you know, a, Knife looking, you know, if it's coming at you, and seriously, people jumping out of the seat, that looked great. You've had some success right. in 3D. Jeffrey Katzenberg has had enormous success in that. I think you can't cheat it because the consumers in this world of Twitter and tweeting and Facebook and what have you, if you give them a crappy pro uh, product, you're dead. So t how... Uh, I'll call it fragmented. Uh, how fragmented is the marketplace? Now, you know, a couple weeks ago, you had Avengers, you had Marigold Hotel, and you had Think Like a Man that were all performing great in the marketplace and as varied as you could possibly imagine. 
So is, is the marketplace that fragmented? Is, is, is that what we have now, a society that has so many different people with different tastes? The short answer would be yes. Right. That, but I also think you have enough of a movie going percentage of the population of the, or the target demo that those movies appeal to that they showed up for opening weekend and then the movies are good. Right. And people liked them and they recommended it to their friends. And at the end of the day, no matter how much we all spend on advertising, you know this, it's all about word right. of mouth. Right. But you have to have at least an opening weekend that gives you a chance. Right. You know, it's, you know a couple of weeks ago, some people had said to us, uh, oh, what to expect is dead. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're expecting this, a movie that we did, we released with Alcon, the movie opened at $10.5 million. Mm -hmm. And, but we saw it, we said, it's funny. Right. It's a pretty funny movie, good cast, and, and you know, the critics are going to always lambast something that right. has all these movie stars all right. jammed into, right. a, into, into one movie. They think it's a gimmick, but it, we thought it was a pretty well-constructed uh, right. picture and, and funny. And, you know, the movie will be, I think the movie will get to $40 million, right. so it'll do 4X in a, right. in a competitive market space. But you have to have enough. But if we had had a lot less than 10, right. If we'd opened at seven, we wouldn't and have held theaters. It goes it would to have 23 been, or 24. And it would have been over. Yeah. Um, but one last question about the international marketplace. Do you, do you imagine having, uh, do you imagine do, doing worldwide distribution at a certain point? Is that one of the, the, the goals of the foreseeable future? As no, you have no, bigger no, movies. No, I, I no. mean, English speaking is a place that we, uh, we like. Which you have, right? We do. We, well, we have, we, we, have, have, we sold Maple right. uh, in, in Canada. Right. Uh, but we have the UK. Right. Um, and so English speaking is probably as far as we go. Right. You know, it's too difficult. I mean, think about some countries. I won't name them. There's some right. countries we can't even fire anybody. Right. Um, and so, and it's difficult enough to hire any, anyone, right. anyone. And then on top of that, try to collect the money or court systems don't work. We'd right. rather be in business with a bunch of international distributors that we've had long histories with right. making money together. Right. That's a much smarter play for us. Okay. That makes sense to and, me. We don't put up the P&A internationally, right? right. Uh, so you're you're obviously lowering your exposure by your minimum guarantees, right. as well as not putting up the uh, the marketing costs. Right. So let's talk about television because Lionsgate has has had some great success in television as well. You have Mad Men, Weeds, uh, Nurse Jackie, um, and don't forget my favorite new show. I don't know. Has anybody seen Boss? Oh, Boss! I love Boss. It's a it's a great show. I love Boss. It, it, I, I will tell Kelsey you, it's going to be on its second season. Uh, it's Kelsey Grammer won the Golden yeah. Globe last year for Best Actor. The, it, the show is great. He plays this corrupt, uh, incredibly complicated mayor of Chicago. Right. Uh, but uh, no, Kevin Beggs and Sandra Stern, who, who run television for us, they're rock stars. Right. I think we have, I don't know, 15 people in our television department. We have 15 series on the air. Right. We, were, we batted 1,000. They batted 1,000 for the year uh, with pilots pitch. Right. They, they, uh, they um, uh, have a show, Dane Cook. Uh, is going to as next caller is going to be right. on NBC as a mid-season replacement, and they have a show that I think can be a hit uh, called Nashville, right? Which now, is going to be out. I'm, I'm sure you saw that article in the Wrap uh, yesterday, I think, where it talked about the revenues from uh, uh, the big studios from television versus feature versus films, and I think it was like 2.5 billion for films and 22 billion for television. So, is television truly that much more profitable? Is that is that a, a harbinger of what the future is going to be like? Look, we always liked television right. um, because John's background right. uh, was television. He had a bunch of hit shows going all the way back to, you know, the Wonder Years, right. and the Nanny, and and uh, I'm Mad About You, et cetera. So, uh, again, but we're we're focusing primarily on the you know, cable side of the business. Right. But the cable side of the business, I said that, and I say that, and then all of a sudden you have all these new players that emerge. Mm -hmm. So we've we've got a show, Genji Cohen, who created Weeds. Uh, for us, uh, her new show is going to be uh, Orange is the New Black. It'll be a Netflix show. Right. I expect us to have another show, one or two <clears throat> shows on, uh, like, for example, we have another show on Hulu. I think you'll see, I believe, and I, get on, I don't have a crystal ball, uh, I think Amazon will be a bigger player right. in the space. Look what they did in the U.K. Right. Um, the U.K. was a place where Sky, frankly, treated us like a redheaded stepchild and, mm -hmm. and because they had deals with all of the uh, majors, so when we try to sell them a, a, a movie uh, to the pay, pay television window there, they'd sort of pick and choose what they wanted. It wasn't exactly a competitive right. marketplace. Um, and so now what happened is Love Film got acquired by Amazon, right. Netflix came in, right. and now we have the state-of-the-art pay television deal. And the thing that th this crosses my mind is that, um, it's, it's funny, I, I feel that that's 
that cable television has influenced or taken away part of the market from from more independent films. You know, for instance, I, I would say that uh, Boss could have been a Marty Scorsese movie 15 years ago. Uh, Nurse Jackie could have been a Sidney Lumet movie 15 years ago with Alan Burstyn starring in it. You know, I mean, you can... S so it feels like the content of quality cable is satisfying a piece of, 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 of ourselves. I, I think it's true, and I'll, I'll give you, again, a we're not, we've not rehearsed these questions. No, so, no, no. We're just but talking. I, I will tell you that I think the best writing in the business is on television. Mm -hmm. So those guys that were writing those independent films that, you know, I mean, think about how many films get into Sundance. Think about, no, better, take a step back. How many films submit to Sundance? Right. 5,000, 10,000, some crazy number. And then they probably put, including the docs, they probably put 100 films maybe in Sundance. Right. And maybe 10 of those get bought. And then you've heard of one of them. Right one or two a year. So the odds are, you know, not in your favor right. in that particular case. So I think a lot of those, those talented writers, and you know, a lot of these guys are writer directors, mm -hmm. that they're saying, wait a second, if I can create a show and, and become a creator or a co-creator of that, and it's gonna be on cable, so I can basically write whatever I want, uh, and uh, that's where I'm gonna go. Right. And, and that's, it's like that old bank robber, you know, in Chicago, uh, I always say Willie Sutton, but it's really it's Willie Loman, Peter. Like Willie Sutton. Well, anyway, he's on the steps of court, and they said, "Why do you rob banks, Willie?" And he said, "Well, that's where the money is. If I were a writer or a producer, right. or producer, director, writer, etc., I would, uh, I'd be focusing on television." Well, I've I've almost said to, I, I said to somebody the other day, I said, "I have a feeling that if I had uh, the if I had bought the rights to The Godfather and had a screenplay by Mario Puzo and Francis Coppola sitting in my hands, it would probably end up." on Showtime or HBO and not as a feature film. Yeah, or a big, big fat miniseries. A big fat miniseries. No, yeah. and, and you know, that's not such a bad thing okay, so let's, the audience let's, is, okay, is so going to see it. So, so let's get back, because really the question then is what makes, what determines whether a project is a, is a film or is quality television in this marketplace? Where's the, how do you differentiate? I, I mean, because that's really the, the question. We, we see a lot of scripts and say, we're not going to make it. Right. And you, if you make it, this may be fantastic, but have you ever thought about television? Right. So, um, and, and we've, we've, I can't tell you who it is, because a couple of these things I think will actually get made. Um, or we'll take some intellectual property we have. I think, I think Red could ultimately be a television series. Mm -hmm. I think Expendables could be a television series. Right. Um, so, where is the line? I think that, you know, it, again, you've got to think, well, can we serialize this? Can we, can we make this more than one movie? Can we, is this a better place for us to go? Right. And then you have to get talent to agree. Right. Uh, but it used to be a terrible conversation if you said to some you know, major piece of writing talent or directing talent, hey, would you think about doing television? It was right. like you were slapping them in the face. Right. And now it's like, well, is it for cable? No, well, look, you know, Mark Gordon just produced something with Roland Emmerich. I had Philip Noyce just had a series that was picked up. Martin Campbell was in my office last week. He had a series that was picked up. So you've got a lot of filmmakers that are certainly doing that way. So, so do you think then that the studios will make less films? Is that what you imagine happening in the future? Well, there are... X number of majors, right? And, and I know that people have said that we're a mini major. I think our box office share, and then people said that maybe there was an emergence of the new major. We don't want to be the new major. Uh, so when I hear that, I sort of bristle when I hear that term. We always wanted to be the biggest studio with the, with the, I mean, the uh, smallest studio with the largest library. Right. That was sort of our goal. Right. Well, you've accomplished that. Um, so the idea is, uh, yeah. Do I think they'll make less films? I do. Right. I think they'll focus on what they think. Are, have got some sort of built-in mass appeal with some sort of intellectual piece of property. And then what they'll do is, like we do, they'll end up buying pictures right. that they, uh, because they'll take the production risk out of it and they'll buy it for the right price. But for the most part, they'll leave us alone in that space, space with the searchlights of the world because mm -hmm. to move the needle at, you know, look at the overhead at Sony, right. at Sony right now. Right to move the needle at a giant conglomerate like Time Warner or Sony or Viacom, Viacom's in the channel business, Right. Um, you need a giant win. Right. And so I, I do think they'll let Well, that's make, the good news for us is that places like Lionsgate are looking for big wins but are also making movies that, that uh, you can have just domestic on and can, can do a nice profit, profit on. We've done it over and over again. I mean, we've made, uh, you know, we've made a lot of our partners very rich. Yeah. 
Uh, what about the digital space? What's your thinking about that? I mean, will there be series for internet? Where, where, is, where, where do you see that going? Well, look, I mean, uh, my friend Kevin Spacey is doing, uh, uh, with Venture, he's doing right. House of Cards as an for original Netflix. for Netflix. Right. We're doing Genji Cohen's Orange is the New Black for Netflix. We start shooting that, I think, in August. Um, we have uh, uh, Hulu's going to buy a series. Do you see Netflix as digital, or do you see it as cable? I, I think Netflix is an MSO. Okay. So, you know, you have 23 million subs. Right. I mean, Showtime's not in 23 million homes. Right, right. So all of these guys uh, are competing with each other one way or the other. I'm not a, I, I don't have a crystal ball and say how many people are going to unplug. I do believe that for the first time ever, content has turned into an impulse item. Mm -hmm. The best example I can give back in Nantucket last summer, I made a mistake of taking my five-year-old, who was four at the time, to the grocery store. Right. And it, we, went, we rolled by a red box machine, which, right. which he'd never seen. Right. Daddy, stop. Mm -hmm. And you know, of course, I ended up going home with a bunch of movies right. I had no intention of Right. Bringing, bringing home, and, and you know, it's a bunch of crap too, but they say it's one day rental for whatever, $9.99. Right. I don't think I brought them back for 10 days. <laughs> right. so, so the idea is, uh, so, so I think it is becoming, uh, content is becoming ubiquitous in different platforms. So whether it's an over-the-top offering from Netflix, or whether it's your video on demand. A video on demand, when you say digital, I think video on demand, okay. Okay. because VOD to me, that's the future. And that's not the same guy that's going to go, or a gal that's going to go to Target or Walmart on Tuesday mm -hmm. because those people want to own the movies. And other people that are sitting in their apartments in New York and, you know, they can watch a movie for four ninety nine over a 24-hour period, that's a different buyer altogether. Right. And couldn't find a Walmart on a map. Right. So you're saying that we could be going towards a subscription-based world then? I think so. I think yeah, that you'll I have do too. I think you'll have a subscription boat. I mean, I think that you'll... Be interesting to see what happens with a la carte. Uh, and again, not to be, uh, you know, not to be flippant about it, but as long as you control quality content, mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter to us. Right. Because the idea is for us to have that content to whatever, what, whichever of those platforms is taking off, you know, whether it be, you know, digital or broadcast or cable or video on demand or Netflix streaming or whatever it happens to be. We just have to have the content. We've got to create the content that people want to watch on whatever channel or format or distribution mechanism that they like. Right. So you're saying create good content, and it might be theatrical, or it might go to Netflix and do just as, just as well. It might. We, we did a thing called, uh, we have a, a significant percentage in this little company called Roadside. Right. You know, you know Eric and Howard. Right. Uh, we do all their ancillary distribution. We're a, a, an equity, a significant equity holder in their company. And we can experiment with them. Uh, we did margin call, which right. was with Kevin Spacey. We did day and date uh, with theatrical on that. Uh, we went uh, a very early window, for example, on the Taylor Lautner movie, Abduction, which uh, frankly saved our ass from mm -hmm. a profitability standpoint because mm -hmm. they did so well. Right. I, I think you'll continue to see that. I think you'll see people playing with those windows. <clears throat> it's, um, you, it, you have to... I was going to say at the end of the day, and then I read the other day, which it said it's the most overused expression in the history of man. <laughs> right. But at the end of the day, uh, consumers are going to tell you what they want, when they want it, and how much they're going to pay for it. Right. That is reality. Right. And anybody that thinks differently, I think they're going to end up like dodo birds. Okay, so, so, in, so in terms of um, the challenges that you've had and the successes you've had, I mean... What are the life lessons that that you've learned in the in the past 15 years of of this of this challenging uh, entertainment career? What have I learned? I, I, I'll tell you one thing: don't try to dream a square peg into a round hole. Right. What I mean by that is, from a studio standpoint, distribution. If if something's not ready, if the script's not ready, just wait. Right. Postpone, figure out the timing of it. it come, movies come together when they're going to come together. The other thing I've known is that the, the only, uh, you know, there's, there's so much of our business is a commodity business. But if you, as a producer, like, for example, David Heyman, right. you own content that somebody wants. You, I mean, meaning you own intellectual property. You've optioned a script or you have a... Harry Potter, by the Harry way. Harry Potter. Yeah. Uh, you... I, which I think he bought for $750,000. Right. So if you 
can find a piece of material uh, early or, you know, it could even be, you know, look, look at Ender's Game. Eric Feig went after that. Ender's Game came out, the book came out four or five years yeah, ago. Yeah, well, longer, I think. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, and now it's a bestseller again mm -hmm. uh, on the New York Times best, uh, bestseller list. So I would say, again, control great material. It could be the source material, it could be a book, it could be a short story, it could be, you know, something from the New Yorker five years ago that no one optioned. You'd say, oh, wow, this would really work. Right. So uh, control that. I, I think that I've, I've learned that that is the key to success. I also think that if you cannot pitch a, a movie on sort of what it's about relatively quickly. It's a bad sign. Yeah, it is because yeah. the studio, if the movie gets made, the studio is in the position where we're the ones that have to be able to sell it with, you know, trailers and 15 and 30 second TV spots. Right. So if you, the producer, can't pitch it to us in a reasonable time frame, no chance. I mean, we did a movie, uh, you know, we, we don't buy pitches in the room. Right. That's just not what we do. We typically buy uh, finished scripts right. because we're not big on developing. Um, you know, it was like one movie we did, uh, one of the only pitches we bought it was in my when I was producing movies, sort of as I was segueing out of investment banking before Lionsgate, was this movie called Employee of the, uh, Employee of the Month. Mm -hmm. And it was Dane Cook and Jessica Simpson who ended up in it. But the, the pitch was, the guys came in and they said, all right, here's the pitch. Two guys, they work in like a Costco or a Walmart. They're friends, the hot cashier shows up. And they uh, hear through the rumor mill that uh, she sleeps with, wherever she is, the Employee of the Month. Right. And that was it. That was it. And that was basically the premise for Who that movie. Who wants to be that guy? Yeah. That's right. <laughs> okay, who's going to win? So the way they, these guys will kill each other. So that was a really simple pitch. Right. And same thing with Saw, be kill or be killed. And otherwise, if it gets really complicated, like, for example, Crash, very difficult to explain. Right. On something like Crash, we bought a finished movie in Toronto. Mm -hmm. We followed it all along. We liked the script. We liked Paul Haggis. Uh, but we bought that. And, 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 and i tell you how crazy this business is. We were the only bidder. Right. Wow. So now, one of the things that you guys have done particularly well, I think, in, uh, uh, is, is some of the marketing uh, th things that you've done, uh, some of the marketing uh, tactics that you've used. I know with, uh, with Lincoln Lawyer, you were the big advocate of, going, of using Groupon to help uh, market the film. So how did that come about? I know that you, this was all your idea, which well, was, no, turned I was out in, good. So yeah, I, it turned out I was well. No, so I, I would say that... Uh, Again, you got to be able to try new things. Right. I, I was in a I was at a Morgan Stanley conference, and I was the introduction. The guy that was speaking before me, uh, the banker said, and I'd like to introduce this fellow as the chief operating officer of Groupon. It's the fastest growing company in in world history. Right. I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> what was that? And so I listened to the presentation. I said, you got to be in the movie business. So it was great because Lakeshore was uh, nimble enough. Mm -hmm. It's a very sort of small group of decision makers at your shop, and. Uh, so we just looked at it and said, look, we're going to blast out emails and, and trailers to 35 million people. And, yeah, we're going to lose a bit of, a bit of money on the discounted tickets because we have to subsidize some of that. Right. But, boy, oh, boy, 35 million people, which in, we can pick our demo uh, to, to, to blast to, that made sense. We've done a lot of stuff like that. Our, our digital guys are great. Uh, Hunger Games, you also did a big. We've got, a, we've got enormous presence uh, in social media. We've, uh, we've got a game now. There's an iPad game. There's, you know, which my five-year-old said, can you play? And I said, no. Um, so the idea, and he calls it uh, Hungry Games. Right. Um, so the, the, the idea is uh, uh, you've got to be able to try certain things. I think Twitter's going to ultimately turn into a tremendous way to market good movies. Right. Um, we've done some, some fun things there. You, you mentioned Groupon. We've, we've changed windows around. I think you'll see us do more and more with Apple. Uh, we're doing more and more with Microsoft. Uh, the idea that you can have exposure in a fairly inexpensive fashion right. uh, makes a lot of sense. We did a thing. Uh, and it's more youth oriented too. Let's, I mean, some of it. I mean, it Groupon isn't, but, but certainly Twitter and for, for Hunger Games, you're going more, more youth oriented. But Lincoln Lawyer was not yeah, really Lincoln a, Lincoln Lawyer uh, wasn't, wasn't, right. wasn't really a uh, youth movie. Uh, so I would say that you have to watch. I mean, think about it for a second. Look at the market caps of, even though Facebook's had a crappy right, run, or right. initial run, look at the market cap of Facebook and what Twitter's expected to get. Right. And, and, and you add up three or four, and even Yahoo has had, had a hard time. Or look at Amazon with a right. $90 billion market, right. market cap. These companies weren't even around 15 right. years ago. You add up three or four of their market caps, they're way bigger than the combined market cap of Sony. Right. 
Time Warner, right. Viacom. Right. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. I mean, if, we, if you ignore those entities, you're dead. OK, I think we're now ready to have some questions. So if uh, I, I, can... I got to stand up. I feel like uh, yeah, you know, please, Peter please. said, what's one of your favorite movies? I said Butch Cassidy. I feel like one of those guys that, <laughs> you know, that thing where the Sunday kid, he couldn't shoot anything unless he was moving. I kind of feel that way. Now, what happens now? Do we collect these cards? Is that what, it, what happens? I, I think they're afraid they're going to ask us something if we don't. I don't really care, Gary. They can ask us whatever they want. Yes. How do you minimize risk when giving new talent a chance? What is the most valuable thing a new producer director can bring to the table? I think I answered that, which is control content or something you can, because most studios are fairly, no matter what you read, are fairly honorable places. I will tell you that if somebody said to us, it brought us something completely new, and even if they didn't have the rights, they said, look, I can't get the rights unless I get a studio on board. My sense is you would get attached as a producer. Uh, how do you minimize the risk? Um, you got to believe in what it, is that you're, what, what it is that you're selling. And, you know, have some elements that, that uh, you know, have, have it well thought out. Don't you? Because, you know, the questions I always say, well, what, what, do, you, what do you see the movie to be? And I'm not in that many pitch meetings anymore. But... What do, you, what do you think the movie's going to be? What, what do you think cast looks like? I mean, what, what do you, what, like, who would be in the perfect world if you had a magic wand? Who would direct this? I mean, those are the type of things you can get. But control, ha have a, if you can't control the IP, have an idea of uh, what you would do with it if you did. Okay, here's a question. If Monster's Ball came to you today, would you buy it? <laughs> you know, given that she was the goddess of, of Lionsgate. Probably not. It would probably be a movie that we would buy at a festival. Right. Uh, it'd be my guess. OK, we, so it, if you saw it at a festival, might you buy it? Oh, well, for sure. For sure. It'd be, and, and we might we'd probably put it out through Roadside, because right. we'd probably say this movie can, can catch an audience. So, so what you're saying, too, is that there are various segments that if you hit, if you hit the bullseye in that segment, like Marigold Hotel or yeah. Monster's Ball hit, hit a, it, it, maybe it was a one quadrant movie, but it was right in the bullseye of a one quadrant. quadrant. It was, and, and remember, Monsters Ball, Gary, it, it, the budget was $4 million. Right. I, I was laughing, I'm friends with Mark Force, the director of that. I think his, his, the, he just finished, or is finishing, uh, I want to say War of the Worlds, but that's not what it is. What's the Mark Forster movie? War, uh, War, World War, War Z. War Z. Okay. Yeah, I mean, right. I think the budget of that movie must be. 30, I, I, 40 times yeah, Monsters Ball, yes. maybe something like that. But anyway, so the I idea is we would probably going back buy for that. reshoots and they're spending well, like, I don't know, seven I, weeks reshoots. I don't know about yeah. that, but the, the, uh, and it's not our movie, so I don't really care. Right. <laughs> I would care otherwise. Okay, here's a, here's a good question. How much does foreign factor into your acquisition choices? Well, if Patrick Waxberger were here, who's probably the best foreign guy in the business, yeah. he would say he doesn't want to buy a movie domestically unless he controls foreign rights. Right. Patrick is the, was the co-founder of Summit that uh, Lionsgate just... And I, okay, and, and I, what I would also say, if Patrick were here, if you were being 100% truthful, he said, that is true. However, if it's really great domestically, I'd go ahead and buy it. Right. So, but if we think that you have a package that you can put together and we can cover 70 80% of the budget between subsidies and foreign, that's obviously compelling. Right. One, another question, are there genres that you don't believe in because they won't travel? Or you're open to all genres, right? I, I think that anything. I, but you, all you want to know is that you can get one segment or uh, quadrant to show up opening weekend. Right. OK, let's talk about another quadrant, since you have th uh, two children. Uh, Family-friendly films. What's your feeling about that? Do, you, do they have to be big animation movies? You know, that's not our thing. We've, we've done... But you've, we've, must been, you've watched done, a ton no, no, of them did, lately, right? Oh, my God, I know more. You know, we yeah. distribute Bob the Builder, Barney, and... Uh, right. And uh, what's the other one we have? I should, Thomas the Tank Engine. Oh, my God, I want to kill myself. But the... Uh, uh, the but, uh, but, you know, it's funny. There's some funny stuff, too. And, and this is why Netflix is great. I, you know, that Phineas and Ferb, you know, the stream... I don't know if you've ever seen yes, that. That's yeah. a pretty funny show. It is funny. And your buddy Tom gave, turned us on to the backyard again. So I know a lot about that, too. Uh, but we did, you know, we tested every once in a while. We did Alpha and Omega. We had a partner, an animation studio in India. Uh, I think we made a little bit of money. Uh, for the right thing, we're not going to, I, I doubt we're going to be big in the animated space. We might once a, once a year uh, for the right economics. Right. But big family movies, highly unlikely for, for live action. 
uh, there's a question about dramatic films. I mean, look, look at a movie. Yeah. This is, okay. I'll give you that. It's yeah. not a family movie, but we had one of the great movies of all time. Yeah, we tell you, in the 13 years, 12 years I've been there, we had a movie last year that came out. It did, well, we spent a lot of money on it. Right. We spent probably $30 million releasing the movie. And the movie did $13 million of box office. Anybody see Warrior? Yeah, Warrior. I, I knew you were going to say that. Warrior is an awesome movie. Awesome movie. Okay? Yeah. We couldn't get people to go. Uh, is, is, now, th this is a question about the challenge of dramas right now. Is that, was that part of the challenge? Is that... Yeah, and, and you know, we had great cast, but not giant movie stars. I think right. Tom Hardy will be a giant movie right. star. He's not yet. It's, uh, Joel Edgerton's interesting, too. I've met him the I think other he is, day. too. Yeah. That's two, but yeah. both those guys are great. But we... Uh, Big dramas like that, very hard. What else? Let's see. Um, with your Wall says, Street background. With your Wall Street background and success of female lead, lead uh, Hunger Games, is there a moment moment for insider trading movies with female leads. <laughs> really you know, we're doing uh, we're doing a movie uh, arbitrage uh, with Roadside. Uh, are you really? We yeah, we are doing that. So look at that. You got an answer. Arbitrage <laughs> Richard Gere, Richard Gere, it's a, a Finnish movie. We had a great success I said with Margin Call. Um, I think Jennifer Lawrence is a massive movie star. A massive movie I star. I think we'll do uh, something else with her. We've got this thing uh, uh, Eric Feig bought uh, uh, what is it Peter the Glass House? The Glass <laughs> House. Uh, we have uh, uh, something we have a couple of different things in development that we think uh, that, that could be big, and, and we do believe that there is uh, enormous opportunity uh, for female leads as right. well. You know, we we uh, had another great movie, did only did forty five million dollars at box office, but uh, which was uh, actually a uh, I think she was I don't know thirteen at the time. Uh, uh, Chloe Moritz. Uh, oh yes, kick -ass. yes, kick ass. Uh, what made you take a chance on Tyler Perry movies? He, the biggest mis mistake we made financially is he put up half the money on the first one. Right. Wish we hadn't done that. Uh, he's, he's done very well, hasn't he? Oh, my he? God. The, uh, yeah. the, the franchise. Hundreds, hundreds of millions of dollars. It's, uh, it's been great. No, because I, you know, he had a following. I think you know, he was very good marketing himself, but he said, come down and watch my show. Sells out arenas and these incredible uh, uh, tours that he did. And uh, Mike Pasternak, uh, uh, who's a senior executive with the company, in production, just believed in it and pounded the table and said, this is going to work. And as I said, we, we Tyler put up half the money and it was right. a very low budget. And that he, but now he owns half the movies. Right. Uh, so, uh, uh, but good for him and, and ultimately good for us. Can you tell us a little bit about the start of Mad Men? No. Uh, I, the, because Matt Weiner is, uh, I can't even think about the phone calls and emails, I would guess, if I talked about that. But I will tell you okay. this. It's a great show. It's a great show. And by the, the way, the season, the season finale is tonight, right? I mean, I, I'm going to see it. Oh, tomorrow night. Oh, tomorrow, tomorrow night. I, I'm getting, I'm a day ahead. Um, you didn't like that question, I guess. No, I don't. No, well, <laughs> here's, here's an, That's the one I find interesting. Here's an interesting question. What do you want to be when you grow up? I, I, I'm a big fan of uh, evolving. I had a Wall Street career for a long time, and I've, now I'm in the entertainment business, I don't know, someday maybe write, run a charity or uh, some, some foundation, I don't know, it's uh, uh, hard to know. I'm not dead yet. Well, great, I think that uh, that finishes our, uh, our I'll take one more session. question from the audience. If somebody wants to be brave and stand up, take a, take a risk. Yes, sir. Look, the reason that, just so you understand, the uh, reason that we typically don't take submissions uh, without an agent is because what will ultimately happen, Gary knows this, is that you'll send us a package and then we'll have something in development and then two years later it'll come down and we'll say, well, that was the same thing that we had here. Uh, and so we get sued. So that's why typically that we don't, we don't do that. I will tell you that, that um, we have a, uh, uh, the simple thing to do uh, would be to uh, not give away the story, to say, here's my concept of what I have, and you can submit that to Lionsgate, you can mail it to me, okay? You can send it to me, and I will send it to one of our guys, Jim Miller or John Sackey, one of the development guys, and at least I'll give you a fast answer, okay? But the, not typically what I do, but I'm happy to do it because you asked the question. Any, one more question? Are we out of time, Gary? I think, oh, last, last, yes, quest, last yes, question. Yes. <laughs> wow, you jumped up.
Yeah, I, I mean, I have my opinion. Gary, I'm kind of curious your view because you're, you're out there pitching your, your films to all the, you know, Gary will, will right. basically make a deal and then he'll shop in various places, including us. Would you rather there was a, was there, there was a uh, actor attached or just the director? Uh, well, here's, the, here's what I guess I would say is that um, there are certain screenplays where you read the character's parts and you know that you will get an actor. So if, if the script is that good and I know that I'm going to be able to cast it, then I don't need it. But if, uh, if, if the script isn't that good and the actor is attached to it and the actor makes it better, then that's another thing. I mean, if you had a script of Hunger Games, I think you would sit there and say, I don't know who the girl is, but I know the girl is out there and she's great. You know, and by the way, Jennifer Lawrence, we had all seen in uh, Winter's Bone. I don't, was that your no, Roadside, yeah. Roadside, you know. And she, and she was terrific, but, but there were other girls too. But, but, you, but absolutely, when she was cast in Hunger Games, it, you know, it did feel absolutely, it felt quite perfect. You know, Gary has a movie that, I don't know if you guys have announced it yet. I was thinking Which about American Post Pastoral. Oh, well, we're trying, yeah. Okay, there's a movie that's an unbelievable script, and, and now he's, you know, I think you're close to getting a director. He'll right. get whatever actors he wants. It's just actor crack, that no. movie. Let's, so, let's, so, let's pray, let's pray. So, uh, don't you think? Yeah, I think, I think. Yeah, yeah. so, so uh, that's what I, I would answer that question in a similar fashion. What was the second question? I forgot it already. Yeah, yeah. it was. Oh, no man's land. I know I got it. Twenty, fifty million dollars. I think that you, sh you should be able to make a movie for outside of it, unless you get some great giant movie star. You should be able to make a movie unless it has crazy special effects for fifteen million dollars or less. And I think that's one way to go because guys like Gary and guys like us, Lionsgate, will say, okay, we'll get the right actor on that. We can sell foreign for ten, twelve million dollars. We have three million dollars of risk. If the movie hit t turns out terribly, it won't even go out theatrically, but we'll get our money back. When you start getting thirty, forty million dollars, that is no man's land. You, you, the, the studio can get crushed because now you're really—it's like that, you know—in in tennis, you're you're, you're standing in that, that area where people are going to just hit balls at you all day long. Right. So I, I do believe in no man's land. So so uh, be careful in that that range. You know, at the same time, if you have the right action movie that is original, uh, you can make it for the right price and it can work. It, it's funny. I, I when I think back to this particular theater, I remember. Many years ago, I uh, saw uh, Mad Max in this theater. And, um, you know, the one with Mel Gibson, the one that, not the, not the prequel, but the, the real, the first Mad Max that we all saw. And I remember uh, Michael Cimino and Bob Rafelson were sitting behind me. And Cimino had just done um, Deer Hunter, so he's a big director. And he couldn't believe what he saw. Uh, that George Miller had put something on the screen that was just unbelievable. And just, you knew it was going to work. You knew it was going to be a huge hit. There are those movies that don't have huge visual effects but have um, a, lot action, of action. a lot of action that uh, if, you, if you have the right star and you catch the right, the right niche, you, you can really run with yeah, it. Yeah, we're going to end it on the same thing we talked about before, timing. Right. Thanks very much, you guys. Thanks.